So Pyle and I have actually known each other for over five years now. I've been really lucky to have her as an incredible friend, but also basically like a family member. She's looked after me since I've been here. And it's been so incredible to see you do everything from class pass to motherhood to creating the most incredible dance academy that you'll ever see in your life. Uh, and now all the new adventures that you're doing. So thanks for being an incredible inspiration to me. And I'm so happy to be here with you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> The first question I wanted to ask you is, whenever I hear you talk about your work, there's always so much thought and intention that goes behind it. So what would you say are the three core values that you've cultivated to really build an intentional and mindful business? Only three. <laughs> only three, only three. Give me your top three. I'm like, I can start listing a ton of yeah. things. Um, I think for me, the first thing always starts with passion. Mm. Whether, you know, Class West was dance, obviously Saw is dance. Um, everything I do in my life really starts from a sense of passion that I have. And then I think it resonates into other people. So I think that would be one. Um, another one would be impact. You know, we talk about this a lot. I think I've always believed that we should be fulfilling our purpose and purpose is about impacting other people's lives. So I think everything I do has to touch other people. Um, and the last one, which is in the title of this because Megan knows it's my favorite word, but I love creating timeless things. And I know, you know, that can sound cliche, but for me, that means it like outlasts me. So being able to build a company and sell it and have it keep working in the world to me is actually very much success because it's not about being like, okay, it can only work if I'm involved. It has to be that I put the foundation and built something that the world needs so much that it can last without me. And I think that's like really an important thing for all of us to think about what we're creating and you know what our legacy ultimately is. Yeah, and it's been so beautiful to see you do that no matter what project it is you're doing, no, no matter what business you're starting. I feel like you always think of those three things and many more, but especially those three, no matter what you're doing. And I think it probably helps you to set the intention and desire for that project and helps you to kind of keep it on, on, on track. track. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Throughout your journey, you've probably had so many hurdles and so many closed doors. How have you managed to maintain your positive energy, your um, enthusiasm for the work that you're doing, no matter what's happened um, in those areas? I think when you sign up to solve a problem in the world that you are so adamantly excited to do, you don't let the doors that are shutting in front of you stop you. You just find another door. And I, you know, I really believe that when you sign up to be a founder, which is what today is all about, um, it's really about this sense of I'll, I'll do this for the rest of my life if I had to, or don't do it, right? I know sometimes, and it's funny in this day and age, like being an entrepreneur feels like a sexy road ahead, but it's honestly very hard. And if you don't really believe in what you're doing and all those like that foundation and that heart isn't there, you're going to give up. And that's just what's going to happen because it's not going to be easy and it's going to feel hard along the way. And I don't know, I just always really believed in what I was doing. And I think that's really important for the things that I have done in my life. And you've seen me along the way, like I've started things and I'm like, oh, this isn't working. Yeah. It's because my heart isn't really in it. And it's important to, to understand that and not sort of push yourself further into it if you don't have to. Yeah, I've noticed that in myself. Whenever I end up doing something where I'm not fully behind it, I don't fully believe in it, my enthusiasm, my desire to do it really runs out fast. And I think it's a good indication of when you should or shouldn't keep going with something. If you find yourself lacking enthusiasm and excitement for it, then it's probably a good sign that you need to either decide again what your intention is for it or redirect yourself. And whenever you have gone through any of these difficulties or hard moments, have you had any specific practices or anything that you've done from the moment you started Class Pass to now that has helped you get through those difficult moments where you've wanted to give up? I really believe in setting a plan. Like to me, when I'm at my lowest moment, it sort of energizes me to be able to say, okay, what am I gonna do to get out of this? And the feeling of just getting out of it and writing down steps for that is what really gets me out of it. And this is like in anything in my life, whether it's like personal stuff, professional stuff. I just believe when you sort of feel that, like that low, to me, if I just go it on paper and sort of start writing out dreams, start writing out steps, 
I stop thinking about what I'm feeling and the negative energy and I start really putting all of my intentions into getting the plan done. And I do believe that in myself. I know if I write something down, I'm gonna do it. Like that's something, a pact I have with myself is I know how to execute. Once again, if I really believe in what I'm gonna do. So a lot of the times it's just about figuring out what those next steps are and re-energizing yourselves to get stuff done and move, move forward. Yeah, I really think it does. There's like science done behind the concept of planning and writing down what you want to do and it creating serotonin in your body. And so every time I feel stuck, I've started doing the same thing. I will plan, create every single little step in between that I need to do to get me to that point and then just start at step one. Um, so I think that's really, and you talk about that a lot in your book, Life Pass, don't you? I feel like that's what the basis of your book was, is yeah. how to set goals and intentions. I believe if you have like a priority list that you really believe in, you'll be able to move forward. And if you're not excited about that list, you're never going to do it. It can't feel like a grocery list of stuff you have to do. It has to truly feel like the stuff in your life that you care to accomplish. And once again, whether that's in your personal life or professional life, it's all the same. Yeah, that's so true. I, um, I wanted to ask you, what would you say, if anything, if you have had to sacrifice anything in this journey, what was it and was it worth the sacrifice? Reflecting on it now. That's a, that's a hard one. Um, you know, I recently, uh, I had a baby just two months ago. No, she's so cute, everyone. Um, and so I, cute. you know, I'm, I'm 40 years old. Uh, and, you know, it, it definitely t took me a little bit longer to, like, get pregnant this time and stuff like that. And I, I wouldn't say it was a sacrifice. I think it was just more of feeling like I know I postponed some things in my life and I'm very okay with it. And I took the precautions that I needed to. It's just one of those things where I always would think back and I'm like, there was a point where I was like, oh, no, like, did I make the wrong choice here? But at the end of the day, like everything worked out. And I once again put all my energy into being like, I'm having this little girl, no matter what world. Um, and so, you know, it's I think you just have to, you know, re re adjust your life at times. And I don't regret anything in my life, you know, and that's I think the biggest thing to look back and say is I don't have any regrets. And I think when you when people think about their life, they think everything has to happen in one time. I've been like that so much. I'm like, I have to have everything in order. Every part of my life needs to be fully working and right. But the fact is, when you are doing something like a business or you're trying to build something, there may not be sacrifices, but you'll have to pour your energy way more into one area. And so figuring out what areas are gonna take a slight hit and knowing that before you start it helps you to be okay with it while you're going through it. So you may not be able to be 70, you may not be able to be 50, 50 in everything or whatever it's 30, 30, 30, whatever the, whatever the proportions are, whatever you're trying to focus on, you know that your health may suffer a little bit because you have to do long nights. You may know that you may not get enough time to date or see family members, but realizing that before you get into it is probably going to help you to digest it as you're going through it. And especially not feeling guilt. I think that's the biggest thing is you, you feel like you have to say yes to everything or you feel guilty for not doing things. And I think when you have so much great stuff to say yes to, the no's become easy. Like, I really believe in that. When your life is so fulfilled with the things you're just waking up to that are so meaningful, you stop feeling bad about saying no. I had, um, I started, I decided I wanna go into building a business quite late in life and my husband was already an entrepreneur and he was just doing everything and doing the most all the time and so when I got into it, I realized I was feeling so much guilt for being a wife who wasn't always present because I was that all the time. I would travel everywhere with him, I would show up everywhere, I would be making meals because I want to, not because I'm a woman. Um, and I just, I wanted to do all those things but it got to a point where I realized I wasn't happy fully being that person and I wanted to explore what I wanted to do. But doing that meant I couldn't necessar necessarily be there for all the dinners. I couldn't go everywhere he was going with him. And it took me a while to separate the, I can be a businesswoman and I can do all those things and still remain a good wife and still remain a good family member and still do all those things. But it takes a while to get your mind out of that guilty mindset. Absolutely, and, and that really honestly, I think goes into everything, goes into your friendships, it goes into your team when you're managing people. I think people forget that they don't know how to set those boundaries or how to manage in a way that is still fulfilling for them. And 
at the end of the day, like your team, your employees get energy from you being fulfilled, not you saying yes to everything. And they're actually looking to you. I mean, it's the same thing when you have kids, like everyone is following your guidance of what is right and what is wrong. And you really just need to be able to set priorities and therefore your team will do the same thing. Yeah, I completely agree. In an industry, and I, I mean, I've had conversations with you about this, where you've told me you've walked into a room just full of men. In an industry that's dominated by men, what would you say are the unique strengths and perspectives that women bring to entrepreneurship? Well, the, what I would say in the beginning is, look, entrepreneurship means you're solving problems in the world and every group of people, whether it's gender, ethnicity, anything, there's always different problems that different people are facing. So at the end of the day, it's the perspective that we have as 50% of the world that, you know, of a problem we face that we should be able to solve, right? And it's so funny, when I started ClassPass, I would walk into rooms with all men, and a lot of them would say, why don't you build this for personal training? And I was like, huh? Like, but there's like all these boutique studios that women are going to. And they were like, really? Like, we don't really go to them. Yeah. And I'm like, because it's not your demographic. And it took like boutique fitness to really grow. And then they would, you know, they would see that their wives were all going and using ClassPass. And that's when a lot of them would call me back. And I'm like, this is like, you know, obviously things need to change. I'm not, you know, it's, it's not great for any of that to happen. But I think it's just really finding problems that are unique to you and your community, whatever that community might be. And, you know, and as a woman, I never, ever walked in the room feeling like I wasn't as smart as yeah. someone else. And I think the biggest thing you can do in any of those situations is just walk in with confidence, you know, because at the end of the day, I was the only person who probably could have solved this problem, not them. And it's knowing that inside when you walk in and making sure that they realize that you are the right person to be solving that problem. Yeah, I, I once heard someone say this and they said, when you're walking into an environment where there's majority of something, like let's say you're walking into a room with a lot of masculine energy, you can either turn on your masculine energy and add to it, or you could bring in something that's lacking and bring in feminine energy, and then you're shifting the perspective and shifting that, yeah. Um, next question I have for you is, how would you define success for yourself and your company beyond financial metrics? Like when you were going through ClassPass, how were you defining your level of success beyond anything material money? Yeah, the, the number one metric I focused on at ClassPass was the booking number. So the number of reservations, because to me that was the number of hours of people's lives that we changed. Yeah. And that to me meant more than any other metric. And at the end of the day, it was in a way a financial metric because look, if people were going to class, the company's happy, our customers are happy, and our partners are happy. So it really was the heartbeat of the company. But you know, it, it is sometimes important to look at metrics like that. Of course. And at the end of the day, like even today, like if I bump into anyone and someone's like, I booked a class, it literally brings me the same joy as the first reservation. And I think that's like the power of having those non-financial metrics and those like goals that really mean something because to me, once again, that was an hour of someone's life that this product changed and hopefully they're happier for the rest of the day because yeah, of it. Yeah, definitely. I'm a, I was on ClassPass before I'd met you yeah. and I was using it throughout my time in New York and I feel like those classes brought me so much community where in a place where I didn't actually know anyone or didn't manage to connect to anybody, the classes were kind of my thread throughout the day to build relationships and, and find new people in, in New York. So I definitely can resonate with that. Um, what is something that you value now that you didn't at the beginning of your journey? I always value this one, but I probably value it more now, which would be time. I think it's, you know, one of those things in the beginning, you know, I talk about this in my book about the money and time trade off a little bit where when I was, you know, starting off of my journey, I wouldn't take a cab. I'd walk everywhere, right? Because at that point, you know, I valued my money more than time in a way um, because, you know, I, I, I needed to, to just save and be able to have the means to do what I wanted. Um, on the other side of that now, I'm like, okay, like I really, I really know what my magic is. And so I'm okay with like delegating the things I don't need to do. Uh, and I think learning that as a founder, like w even within your team about what makes you so special, right? To your team. What is it that you need to be working on instead of being in everything has also helped given me a lot of freedom 
to lead in the way I want to lead. And I don't think I would have realized that if I didn't like value my time and my magic as much. And you said you value your magic now. What would you say if for someone who doesn't know, and I speak for myself too, how would you recommend someone finds that in themselves? Like what other tools that you use, the techniques you use to figure out what your place in the world, what your place in business was? It's really, it's simple in a way. It's how do you feel when you do certain things? You know, it's, it's just looking inside. Obviously, like for me, I found that I loved dance when I was very young. And I know that's not something everyone finds at such a young age. But, you know, generally as you're moving throughout the day, there are certain things that bring you joy, whether it's certain, you know, type of work that you're doing, it's certain people you're meeting. And if you aren't getting that, I also recommend changing up your day and finding a way to network with new people, um, you know, try new activities that you aren't doing and you will get a better sense of who you are. And I, I really believe like for me, I think, the universe sort of guided me through the right moments of my life when I was truly following my mission. And so the more you sort of listen to your heart and make decisions that are in line with that, I do believe the right doors open and you stop questioning that. Inside. Yeah, I think I always used to find it difficult because it's hard when there are so many people telling you what you ca you are good at or what you should be good at, what you should be doing, and then other people's voices become your own. What would you have been if you listened to that? <laughs> oh my gosh, what would I have been? I would have been, um, which I love doing, but I would have ended up being a nutritionist or dietitian in a hospital. And I really enjoyed doing that. I definitely think it's still part of my nature. But... I also had a lot of voices telling me the type of person I was and it slowly became my voice without, without me actually connecting to it. And so I had to spend so much time by myself to really figure out my own voice, like make decisions for myself, slowly try things to do by myself. Yeah. And then I was hearing, oh, actually, someone said this would be really good for me to do. And I realized I absolutely despised it and it wasn't something that I enjoyed. Yeah. And so I think alone time was, as much as meeting people was so great, alone time was the place where I started hearing my own voice, which I had kind of dampened for such a long time. I, yeah, so many of us are taught that, you know, I think especially as women, there's so many expectations on us. And how do you get away from that? And what environments help you get away from that? And I agree, like alone time is important. And once again, like for me, it was even, you know, I, I grew up in this pedigree of, I went to a, you know, a good school and then I was at, in, at, at a consulting firm and I was all, I was around very like type A people. And I'm so thankful that I had my artist friends in my dance world because they showed me like a different perspective of who I was. And I would have never seen how much joy that that brought me and actually how good I could be in that if I didn't have that group of friends. Because if I was measuring myself and my success based on another group of people, I probably would have ended up in a complete different place too. <laughs> yeah, when I started, when we started Juni, I kept thinking I have to become this like boss CEO woman. I need to know everything to do with numbers, to do with, I remember once we were sitting five years ago when I first moved here and they were talking about what C-suite or like the different C names. We, we were going to a movie and someone in the car was talking about <laughs> hiring a CFO. And I was like, and what goes, is a what's CFO? a CFO? <laughs> like I had no idea because I just wasn't in that industry. And I became, you know, started Juni a lot later after that. But it made me realize that even though I, tr I decided I would put my all in and try and understand the business, but it made me realize I'm actually so much more of a creative than I am someone who likes to do the back end of the business of, of managing numbers and, and that area. What I love doing is speaking to people and the creative part of creating the formulas of the drink. And so I had to let go of this idea that I had of being a female entrepreneur and what that looks like and how you have to be this big boss in the like background and go to those meetings and show up versus, oh, I want to be the creative side of it and I'm also okay with that and in, rather than investing my time in trying to understand all the parts that I actually don't necessarily naturally go towards let me lean into the strengths that I have and that took a while to yeah. be okay like even sitting or standing on the stage honestly I was like I'm not really a female entrepreneur I don't know why I you know it made I feel like that when I come onto stages like that because it's so new to me but I think leaning into my strengths have really helped me to be more confident in that. You know, when um, we were fundraising for ClassPass early on, there was like a year or two period where I would dress up in like suits and like, I just felt like, you know, and I'm like a petite person. So I would, I just felt like it was like drowning me <laughs> and I'd walk into all these meetings and eventually I just literally showed up in like my Lululemon leggings 
And I was like, this is who I am, and this is the company I'm building. And I felt so much more confident being me. But you know, that, that stereotype when you're a founder is very true. I mean, I feel like I was, I built ClassPass during the whole like boss babe culture and all of that. And, and I felt that too. Like I felt like I, I remember like always, people always ask me about like when I, when I decided to not be CEO anymore. And my biggest fear was the perception of other people because it was like this huge thing. And I'm like, no, I really don't want to be in that role. Like, I really like doing more of like the creative visionary stuff. Um, and it was just this interesting thing because I felt like I was holding a lot of pressure on my shoulders because of that too. And it was so great when I let go of that. Yeah, I have a question about that actually because after closing cl your class pass chapter, I remember us having a conversation about it's almost like people's eyes are on you because they're waiting for you to do this next big thing. How did you free yourself from those industry and public expectations to actually go forward and do what your passion and love was in your dance academy? Yeah, and this has been like a two-year process for me. Um, and it was interesting because I had a book coming out right after it. And what I really needed to do was kind of go inward. And, you know, compared to how many like speaking things and press and stuff I did before, like I really took it down. Like I kind of had to like break up with like PR. I, know. I really did. I just was like, I, I wanted, and like social media, like I just needed to get off. I needed to hear myself think because at the end of the day, back to what we started with in the beginning, my next thing is going to come from me looking inward, not from me looking outward. Right. And not from me comparing myself to what I did in my past. Yeah. And I really needed to find that space and that time and I feel so much happier with the path I'm on now, which is different. And I'm, but I feel like my heart is in it. Yeah. And yeah, like I might not be posting every day or you know, doing press things every day, but I feel really fulfilled in my day to day. Yeah, I've seen that in you. I feel like you went through such a different transition to actually say, no, this is what I want to do, and I'm really confident in it now. When you were going through your class pass era, I remember you telling me there were days where you would forget to eat, there were days where you would get very little sleep, and you went through that for a long period of time. Were there any health and wellness rituals that you did that you feel really carried you through to stay focused and attentive during that time? I mean, I worked out a lot. Of course you did, <laughs> um, using class pass. Like twice a day, maybe. <laughs> I would run and then go to class. Uh, working out probably is what kept me sane. Um, and then obviously like dancing, right? Like dancing to me is not about working out. It was more of a creative outlet. Um, but you know, I, I will say I probably take care, better care of myself now than I did then for sure. But you know, I, I think it's important to make sure you like schedule in the things in your life that you really, that are important to you. And I, I wasn't as good as it back then. And I think I'm better about it now, which is like, you know, making sure that I'm taking care of like my own mental health. I'm taking care of like my physical health and body, especially being a mom and like needing to, to take care of my kids. So um, it's definitely been, been a journey to that. Yeah, I think movement of any kind is so important. I always think of mind movement, body movement, heart movement, all of like movement is a thread that you can pick one area that you want to keep movement in and it will help so much because I think releasing from your mind, releasing from your body and releasing from your heart and having that time to move those thoughts, the energy through your body can help with health, illness, um, your mindset and everything. I realize we've got like five minutes left. I didn't realize that we've been talking for that long. We wanted to open it out for um, questions. If anybody had anything they wanted to ask Pyle or either of us. Go ahead. I think they were going to bring out a mic, Is but I'm not sure. Uh, okay, all right. we can hear you. I'll, we can repeat the question. I can, I, you know what? I can bring down the mic. Oh. I'll swap. Here you go. You want to moderate? <laughs> Pyle, thank you so much. I both of you ladies, I really admire your story and your entrepreneurial journey. And when you created the concept of ClassPass, it's a two-part uh, question. How, since it was a new concept, how did you convince businesses to uh, come on board with your concept? And the second part is, how did you deal with people trying to duplicate it, competitors copying you? So, um, the truth of the business here is, Thank you. when we first started, uh, there were a certain a number of studios that we were able to like sign contracts with. And then there was a lot of studios that, you know, we were so small, we were just sending them reservations. Like they did, we would sort of like put them on the site. We would book a class for people. We would call them 
and just pay full price and let the person in. And then eventually the studio would call us being and saying like, who, who are you guys? Like I have a ton of people coming in saying they're from you. And then we ended up negotiating a deal. So we sort of had to like seed the behavior to get some of them to call us back. And it worked because we were sending them so many people and you know, they always had fixed cost businesses. They loved getting more people. So we were a perfect lead gen to them. But I would say that was like very, being very scrappy at, in the beginning. And we didn't necessarily have partnerships with everyone, uh, but we had to show our value, right? And I think that's the best thing you can do in any partnership is show your value and it brought them to the table. And that's really what, we, what happened in the beginning. Um, your second, oh, copycats. Oh my God. Oh wow, we had so many copycats. I, there was a phase of uh, ClassPass where every day I'd wake up and my team would send me, it was like fit star, fit this, like, you know, like work out here, like work out there. There was one in every country. Um, but we decided that we were gonna win and we ended up raising, uh, what was it, around $40 million right after I had raised 10, like literally within three months. And we hired 60 people in one weekend and we sent them to all the different cities in America. And we basically said, this is our product. We're not going to let anyone take it. So we just really went quickly and took what we, you know, what we wanted to, because I really felt that if we were competing with somebody and a company like ClassPass and a business like ClassPass, we would end up foregoing the mission and we'd end up just fighting financially. And then in that case, the consumers always lose out. You know, and so I really felt that it was important that we sort of took back the mission and won. And I would say we won because most of the copycats are gone now. <laughs> Hello, my name is Cassandra McClure with the Clean Beauty Show. And I am kind of interested in what your goals are for the future of the brand. Do you have an exit strategy? Are you going to sell it? Yeah. So ClassPass actually exited two years ago. So MindBody bought us. So um, I'm actually even no longer involved in the company anymore, aside being a shareholder. But um, I mean, you know, we're partnered in with a great company that has helped us from the beginning. They do a lot of the back end reservations that we always do on ClassPass. So the two companies coming together was always a part of the mission and vision. And so now the company operates and more people are going to class. And like I said in the beginning, like to me, that's the most important thing that matters. Hi, I'm Melissa with SF Fashion. Um, I just have a comment for you. I love ClassPass, and I've been a user for about five years now. <laughs> um, I, I hated going to the regular traditional gym, so just having a variety to go to all of them is amazing. So thank you for creating this thank platform. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hi, ladies. You both are beautiful, by the way. The outfit's amazing. Um, quick question. So, Pai Payal, Hi. how do you give back to female entrepreneurs in the sense of, like, do you do, do you do any, like, coaching or consulting or anything like that? And when you get to a place as a female entrepreneur, when do you give back? Like, I feel like I'm trying to juggle building something, but I'm getting a lot of people to ask me how I'm doing it. How do you balance giving back and building your dream as well? It's a great question. And once again, you have to prioritize how you do it. I think one of the things I've realized, and I advise like very few companies, to be honest, because I am working on other things. But when I find founders where I, once again, like love their mission, love their energy, I will become an advisor to them and help them get to the next like phase of their business. Um, also, I mean, just doing things like this, you know, I think it's as much as I can share my story. I wrote a book because of that on, for the same reason as I felt that I know there aren't many people who look like me who've done what I've done. So I had to find a way to tell my story to other people. It's hard. I wish I had more time and I wish I could dedicate all my hours of my life to that. But there will come a time in my life, like kind of what we were talking about with phases, where I know that that will be a big part of it. And for you, I would say the same thing. Like you'll know when you feel like you're at that phase that where you really want to give back and find a way to do it. And I think there's multitude ways of doing it. It's like writing a book, there's podcasts, there's speaking engagements, there's mentoring sessions you can do. Um, but I really, you know, I enjoy the, the getting involved with someone and really helping them with their journey, which is why I tend to like doing the advisory thing with a company because I can help them from beginning to end. 
Thank you all so much. Thanks. Thank this was you. such a great conversation. Thanks, Robin. I hope you all She's enjoyed lovely. it. And Thank definitely you. drink Juni. Where's your drink? Oh, yeah. I was like, get your Juni. <laughs> Thank you.